The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. We're going to look at several texts today. So um, this is a very specific message. So it's from Satan to salvation. And so I need to speak into what Jesus has done for you by dying on the cross and rising again in regards to Satan. But let me start by reminding you of who Satan is, that according to uh, 1 Peter 5, he is in fact your adversary. That's the way Peter writes it. He is your adversary and he is a roaring lion seeking someone whom he may devour. And I think you've heard a pastor say a time or two, and guess what, Christian? You're on the menu, all right? Uh, So he's a roaring lion, not to mention, by the way, Ephesians 6. uh, It's very important section about the armor of God, but it reminds us that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities, the forces of darkness, the forces of evil in this world. And so that's the reality of Satan, and he is vicious and vile and violent. It's true. And yet, a reminder that he's a conquered foe, a reminder that, well, well, frankly, don't forget what pastor just read from 1 John, greater is he that is in you, that is God, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's referring to Satan, you see. So we remember that truth. And don't forget, too, if you resist the devil, he will, what? Flee from you, the Bible says. And so all of that is true. But this is very specific, you guys. This is talking about our salvation in connection to what Jesus has done for us to Satan. All right? So to get at that, the explanation of the second article of the Creed in the Catechism Uh, is just diamond. There's a couple of re... I mean, I think it's all good, but like, for example, the explanation of the Eighth Commandment, really, really important. Explain everything in the kindest way. That's what Luther writes there, explain it. That's hard to do. In fact, I think you've heard me say, I once inserted, explain everything in the kindest possible way. In other words, there's sometimes I can't explain it in a good way, right? All right, so that's a good one. But this is, this is so solid. So let's say the, uh, the uh, explanation together. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns into all eternity, this is most certainly true. So really as you, uh, first of all, the the whole thing is beautiful and it speaks into the resurrection, but as you read through that, remembering that you are redeemed first from sin and death, but also, and I I insert power there because sometimes we just say from the devil, that's true, but it's important in, in this aspect, what we are talking about today, salvation, from the power of the devil, the power that the devil had over you pre-salvation. All right, so first of all, sin and death. So we need to talk about the reality of it. This is what we normally do, uh, is talk about the fact that Christ redeemed me from sin and death. So therefore, Paul writes in Romans 5, 12, therefore just as sin uh, came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So again, the two are connected. You know, we're going to read it in a second, the wages of sin is, is death. So the two are intimately connected, you understand, sin and death. And let me make sure you understand, not just physical death, but eternal death. Eternal death as well, all right? So let's look at Romans 6. We'll go over a chapter, Romans 6, and beginning in verse 15. Again, if you have a Bible or a device, if you're a visitor, there are blue Bibles in the pews for you, and the page number is on the screen, 1177. So uh, as you turn, let me just remind you, Romans 5, uh, Paul gives, you heard, we just read it from verse 12, but Paul gives the, the reason that there's death in the world, and the reason there's death in the world is that the infection of sin, it's the best way to say it, we often say it is passed through the bloodline, yeah, because you have kids, because we have kids, we pass our sinfulness onto them, but really I think the best way to look at it is an, it's an infection, it's in the world, everybody's going to get it. But you, as soon as you are conceived, remember David wrote in Psalm 51, sinful at birth, and then it's like the Holy Spirit pauses him, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, all right? It's not doing sin, it's being a sinner. 
And being a sinner causes you to do sin, you understand, all right? So that's Romans 5, but listen to what Paul says that Jesus did for us in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Remember, in, in the first part he says, in, I'm sorry, in the first four verses of chapter 6 he says, should we continue sinning that grace may abound? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And of course, attributes death to sin to our baptism. So all right, uh, by no means, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Either sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. And I think he means obeying the gospel, which is said multiple times in the New Testament, that is trusting Jesus. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin, you're no longer that, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin have become instead slaves to righteousness going from servant of satan servant of sin and death to a servant of jesus verse 19 i'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations can you imagine if i said you people really aren't smart enough to handle this so i'm going to dumb it down for you a little bit right i mean it's almost what paul said although i said in first service when i utter those words when i get to heaven paul's going to say hey joe We need to talk about what you said about what I wrote, all right? So, all right. Just as you once presented your members that you get this as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't have to, but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He keeps coming back. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. Here you go. Don't forget this. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right, so I need to unpack this just a little bit. Let me just remind you, he... From 5 into 6, Paul Paul is reminding us that if you are a Christian, you do not seek sin. If you are a Christian, you are uh, repulsed by that slavery to sin you once had, you see. And instead, you are attracted to to the slavery that you now have to righteousness, that is, the slavery given to you through faith in Jesus Christ and baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this should be... This should be, no, I, I'm not going to have anything to do with that slave of sin. I want to follow, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, the uh, example, the uh, illustration or a human illustration uh, of this very thing, I thought about, I, I'm, I'm really uh, captivated by people that have been falsely accused and, and the efforts that are going on right now to get them out of prison. You know, I just, I just herald the, the attorneys and other people that are working to free people that have been clearly falsely accused or uh, on, on the base of cheap evidence, right? Just not, not really shouldn't have been in prison. But I want you to imagine for a moment a person that has been in prison, say, let's just say 30 years. They've been in prison 30 years and they know they didn't do it. They didn't kill that person. They know that the evidence was sketchy at best. And so someone works and gets them out of prison, right? Can you imagine for one minute That that person, they open the door, they say, you're free to go. Go ahead, go on out. Go live your life. Go be with your family and recapture as much as you can after three decades of being incarcerated. Recapture it. Can you imagine them going, oh, no, I really like it here. I got a lot of friends. They're nice. In fact, I actually like the slop they serve at lunch. No way. The moment they unclicked that door and said, you're free to go, you're bolting, right? You're running. You've seen it. You've seen the stories of when this happens. They're running out. They're ready to get to their family. They're crying. Their family's all assembled. They got banners. They got balloons. They got it all ready to go. And that's the same thing, Christian, that we experience. You've been set free. If the sun sets you free, what? You are free indeed. You're free from that sin. Don't live in the cell. Don't live in the cell with a slop for lunch. That's your old life. Don't live there. But I want you to hear something. He set you free from sin. But when he set you free from sin, did I tell you that they're intimately connected, right? You can't pull sin and death apart. He set you free from death too. 
You see, he's given you eternal life. And, and this is the thing. So I mentioned Romans 5, Romans 6. Don't forget Romans 7. Paul says, yeah, I can't stop sinning. All right? Nobody in this room is going to stop sinning. It's, there's a difference between, there's a radical difference between messing up and asking for forgiveness and picking up your sinful human nature and kissing it full on the lips. All right? Vast difference. Living in sin versus I'm a sinner, but he has set you free from sin And so he's given you, praise be to God, right? He's given you eternal life. Because understand something. If a person dies without Christ, they die once and then they die forever. The the, the scariest part of, of hell, frankly, is separation from God. But let me give it to you this way. You're always dying and never dead. That's hell, you see. And you don't have to go through that. Because Jesus went through hell for you on the cross and won you redeemed you, purchased and won you from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Amen? Amen. All right, so I say the power of the devil because that's the other half of this thing is to remember that he is, in fact, pull, I'll just say, as it's often said about Satan, the roaring lion, pulled the teeth out of Satan. He can roar all day long. He doesn't have any teeth anymore when it comes to you, when it comes to you, all right? So let's, first of all, remember what Jesus said about Satan, you are a, well, actually, this is what Jesus said about the religious leaders. Can you imagine, right? Standing up at a pastor's conference and saying something like this, you are, and he's Jesus, so he can do it. Amen? Amen. All right. So you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer. He wanted to kill you. Remember this. I think people don't, don't really get this. Satan wants the attention, you see. He doesn't like the fact that we are the pinnacle of God's creation. And that Jesus would come into this world, not only are we his beloved creation, that Jesus would come into this world in order to redeem us from what he brought into being, you see. In the garden when he said to to Adam and Eve, he's a half-truth guy, right? We'll get to that in a second. He's a half-truth guy. But he says, surely you will not die. And it was a half-truth. They didn't croak when they touched the tree, you guys, all right? They lived 900 years, actually, and then they... Yeah, the oldest guy in the Bible, Methuselah, 969 years old, and then the Bible says, and then he died. They would die. Touching it brought death in, into our world. It's all right. Let's go to, go to the passage, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, uh, normally we just work on 8, 9, and 10, and beautiful, and I'm going to read it for you in a second. But you need to hear the first couple of verses, because again, Paul gets at something very important in our relationship Uh, said carefully, our relationship to Satan as human beings. So that first verse is um, super famous, and it's past tense because he's writing to Christians. You were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Notice again, you're not stuck in in the jail cell. Right, And what you once walked, following the course of this world, listen to this, prince of the power of the air is Satan, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I'm going to pause there. i read the rest of it in a second. But let me, let me just explain what he's saying there. If you are not a Christian, then de facto you are a follower of Satan. You may not be a member of any church, not a member of the church of Satan, which is a church, by the way, a church, of course. But de facto, if you're not a Christian, that's what Paul writes there. You are following the prince of the power of the air. That's that's who you were. Now, I tell you this because it's as if we can just default to, well, the devil made me do it. He was driving me to sin, la, la, la. And that's just not true. You see, we're very willing participants in his action. He's trying to get you to do stuff, trying to get all people to do stuff, by the way, contrary to God's will, and yet we kind of fall into his clutches, and we do so willingly. The example I have is this, so I've mentioned to many of you that Lake Pataka is just an hour from my house, and so Robin gets home later than I do in the afternoon, so I go out and fish for an hour before my bride comes home. Uh, Did I mention we're empty nesters? (laughs) All right, so... So before my bride goes home, so the other day, I've been wanting to go early in the season because they stock it with trout. And, you know, once it starts getting warm, the trout are very good at hiding. They don't like warm water. And so they dive. All right. So 
I said, I, this is the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to try to catch just any fish, and then hopefully catch, just see if they're moving around yet. So I throw out this wad of worms, all right? If you don't know it, trout don't normally like a wad of worms. And so I throw out this wad of worms, figured I'm going to catch a largemouth bass, pull it in. Okay, cool, fish are biting. Great. I'll put on a smaller thing because they have a little tiny mouth, you know, not a large mouth, all right? So, so I throw out this wad of worms, and I get a strike, and I pull it in. It's a trout! I said, man, this is the hungriest trout I've ever seen in my life. All right, so I take it home. I, I don't take the bass home. I did take the trout home. And so I cleaned it, and I rinsed it out in a bucket before I took it in the house to get the blood and stuff. Sorry, guys, for Sunday morning. Uh, get the blood and stuff off. And I took that water, and there's no guts in it, just blood and, and stuff. Some fish smell. You know how they smell, all right? I presume you do. And so I poured it in the grass off to the side of our house. All right, so... Uh, my famous beagle that, uh, <laughs> that I've preached about before. I think he's the dog that makes the sermon the most is my beagle, Caspian. All right, so Caz, I take him out. And so this, this is an image, all right? I'm going to be Satan for a second. I got me on a leash, all right? And I'm, I'm now Caspian. So we, garage door goes up. Caz always ducks underneath. He's very short. He's only 13 inches tall. So he ducks underneath. And as soon as he gets his nose out onto the driveway, he goes, whoo. Like that. I am not kidding you, you know. He just was pumped about what he was smelling. I mean, in fairness, he's got a nose this long, all right? So, so he, he's straining at the leash trying to get to the, to the gut water. I mean, what, you know? And Pastor Tim and I were talking earlier. He goes, and did he go roll in it? Which you know they're known to do, right? The answer is no, I didn't let him get that far. I pretended to be Jesus in the moment. I pulled him back, all right? So I tell you that because, come on, Christian, it doesn't. It was just water with the smell of fish, and he was chasing after it. It doesn't take much for Satan to get us to blow it, right? Right? We're on his leash, and we just do it. Beautiful thing is, Christ has freed you from that leash. He's taken that power away from Satan. And let me give you the gospel. So let's go back to the Ephesians 2 reading. Beautiful gospel. But God, ha, it's so great. You were dead in your trespasses. You were following Satan. But God, he's the actor being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when he, he loved you in spite of you, Christian, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. He vivified us, brought us back to life, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him. You are resurrected now in God's sight raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And you know these words, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The glorious truth is that God snipped the the, the leash that Satan has on you. He took it away. He took it away. He took away his power, and he did it. This is the beautiful thing, Christian. Again, he did it knowing who you were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And, and we're, we read in the book of Romans, even though that's true, God came to us. Even though he knew, by the way, after we are redeemed, that we'd still struggle with sin. God came to us and gave us his grace and mercy and vivified us, made us alive, made us alive in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. So he stripped that power of the devil away, all right? But there's one last thing you need to hear about this relationship between us, Satan, and God and what God has stripped from him. And it's this, that Satan is an accuser, all right? So let, let me get at it by reading this to you. So Satan, that's the he, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar. Worse than that, he's the father of lies. And what does he lie about? Well, he lied to Adam and Eve, we know that. But he also lies about you. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but Satan is not his name. Satan is his title. In Hebrew, it's this, ha-satan, ha-satan. Ha in Hebrew is the, satan is accuser. He is the accuser of what? Of the brethren. So he points his bony finger at you, you see, and says, oh, please, Jesus. Guy's a mess. Sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah, you can take it, right? Yeah. Um, he's a mess. 
He's not following you. He rarely prays. And by the way, those get whispered in your ear too, right? He rarely plays. He doesn't give enough to his church. He doesn't go to church enough. That's Satan, you see. And in fact, the clearest evidence of that is found in Job 1. If you'll flip over there, Job is just before the book of Psalms. And I'll have to explain this just a little bit when we get through it, but it's pretty obvious what Satan is about. So the term in, in here in Job 1, it's sons of God, is just referring to the angels. So the angels come and present themselves before God. So let's start in verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Hasatan, Satan, also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord, let, let me explain that for a second. Remember, at this time, prior to Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, at this time, Satan could be here, but he could also go in from here and to heaven, in between, all right? He can no longer do that. He's been cast out of heaven, according to Revelation 12. So he's only here now. All right, he's only here now. All right, so uh, where have you come? Going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down. The Lord said, verse 8, to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, to which I always say, I hope he doesn't use my name someday, right? Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth? He's blameless and upright. He fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not, you can see him pointing, right? Haven't you put a hedge around him and his house and all he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. You stretch out your hand and touch him He's a wimp. You stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And yes, in fact, Christian, God gives Satan permission uh, to take everything but Satan, or Job's life, everything but Job's life, all right? Now, I need to, let's just set this aside for a second. I need to explain that. For, first of all, let me remind you, Christian, God owns you, and he can do whatever he pleases with you. God own, That's hard for us to hear, but it's true. He made you, he redeemed you, he can do whatever he wants, all right? The second thing to remember is this, is that we, th and, and you've heard me do this many times, but it bears repeating, we think temporal, earthly, temporal first, eternal second. We think about house, home, kids, car, career, all that stuff first and eternal second. God always thinks eternal first and temporal second. It's not that temporal is not important to him, but understand that in the grand scope of things, what he's concerned about is getting you into heaven with him, all right? Even if you're stone cold busted, all right? He is more concerned about that. That's the explanation, all right? But I want you to see what happened. As soon as God pointed out Job, what did, what did Satan do? He pointed the finger, you see. And the beautiful thing about what Jesus has done for you is this. He can no longer accuse you. There is nothing Nothing that he can say about you. Because when he points at you, he's pointing at a child of God. When he points at you, he's pointing at someone who has the righteousness of Christ. When he points at you, he's a toothless lion, you see. He has no right to you. You belong to Jesus. And so he can accuse you all day long. And Jesus is going to stand in between and say, yeah, I knew about that sin. And guess what? I separated that sin as far as the east is from the west from that child. I forgave him. I forgave her. It's done and done. So why don't you just put your bony finger down, Satan? And in those moments, Christian, when he's whispering in your ear and saying, yeah, but this is what you did. This is how you are. This is who you are. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You belong to Jesus. He can no longer accuse you. Let me say it as, as the Old Testament says it. The guilt of your sin has been taken away. You're still going to sin, but the guilt of your sin has been taken away and placed on Jesus, you see. That's where we live. If, if the subject is just Satan, I'm going to remind you, he's tough, he's vile, he's violent, he's horrible, and yes, he's out to kill you. No question about it. But when we talk about salvation, it's time for me to remind you what Jesus has done in regard to him, that Jesus has taken away his power over you. He no longer has authority, no longer has power, and he can just put his bony finger right down. Amen? Amen. All right. Let me just give you one last passage here. 
This is uh, from John 12, obviously, and it's uh, Jesus is talking about his death. And notice how Jesus says it. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, yes, that's Satan, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Remember that, Christian. He is a defeated foe. Yes, he is difficult. Yes, he is frightening. But he's a defeated foe. And you have victory in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So uh, your senior pastor has seen a lot of frightening uh, spiritual things. I've seen exorcisms, plural. Uh, I've dealt with demoniacs myself. Uh, And uh, so whenever I preach about, uh, let me say that differently. I never preach about Satan. I only preach about Jesus. Amen, right? Right, all right. But when Satan's a part of it, one of the things that I know is he doesn't like to be called out. And so I always stop sermons like this and pray for you and our families and our church uh, because he'd like nothing better than to tear it all up. And so why don't we pray? God, we love you and we thank you that, that we can come to you at any time. You are so wonderful. You are so wonderful. And we thank you for that truth. We thank you, God, that you not only guard us by your Holy Spirit and watch over us, but that, as Hebrews 1 says, that the angels were put into place to minister to those who are being saved. We thank you that we have them at our disposal. And so, on behalf of the families represented here and the families of this church and this congregation in total, we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would reign supreme here, that Jesus would be lifted high, and a sentinel, a hedge of angels, a hedge of angels, would be wrapped around us to guard and protect us. We thank you for this time together in your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.